The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little past them into the impossible. So Arthur C. Clarke. All of us are here today at Interop ITX to learn about new technologies, to expand our horizons, to push past our comfort zone, and to learn about the art of what now might be possible compared to what might have been. Each of us, in some way, is a digital adventurer. Now, the reality is when you venture into unknown territory, there are risks that can be there. There are risks that are abound, risks that lie underneath, lurking, waiting to pop up at the right times. Today, I want to talk about some of those risks. I want to talk about the key trends that drive those risks, and ultimately, I want to talk about what we can do to move forward to get past those risks and embrace a very promising and powerful digital future. So let's start by taking a step back and really thinking about what megatrends exist today. Now, the first megatrend that exists is the idea that small failures can lead to mega failures. You know, we live in an increasingly interconnected world. Our supply chains are interlinked. Our reliance on third parties has never been greater. In fact, I would argue that no organization exists as an isolated entity, an atomic instance unto itself. Instead, every organization is truly part of a much bigger and more complex organism. And while failures in complex systems are inevitable, the ripples of chaos can spread farther and faster now that technology connects us in remarkably astonishing ways. We heard about many of these examples just now from Joe, but in cybersecurity, they're quite prevalent. For example, could you have imagined that one of the biggest data breaches in history occurred because threat actors were able to obtain a single password for a third-party HVAC system? Could you have imagined that a single cyber attack on the United States Democratic National Committee ultimately caused people to question the very foundations of democracy, a hallowed societal institution? Could you have imagined that the makers of Wi-Fi baby cams would become unwitting accessories to the world's largest distributed denial-of-service attack when those baby cameras became co-opted into the Mirai botnet and were then used to bring to the knees some of the most profound and deeply and widely used web services? The pace of innovation is staggering and only continues to grow. And so these mega-failures, in turn, will lead to mega-scrutiny. Security is no longer just a concern for a small minority in the IT department. Everyone from the chairperson of the board to the CEO to every member of the executive suite cares about security issues. Security has become a business problem. Now, you can take my word for it, or you can look at recent earnings reports from companies like Merck and Reckitt Benckiser and Mondelez. All three are publicly traded. All three cited cyber attacks as detrimentally impacting their financial results in their announcements to Wall Street. And we're only at the beginning. The General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, plans to impose fines of 20 million euros, or 4% of revenue, whichever is greater, to any organization that fails to adequately protect the data of EU citizens. GDPR goes live on May 25th. The reality, though, is GDPR is centered on data. It doesn't matter where your organization is located. It could be here in Las Vegas, it could be in London, it could be in Lima. As long as you process the data of an EU citizen, you have to be concerned about your own GDPR readiness. Now, these mega-failures, in turn, lead to mega-scrutiny. And mega-scrutiny will, in turn, lead to personal accountability. The reality is that there will be no more sacred cows. Anyone from the chairperson to the board to the CEO on down can see their career as negatively impacted in the wake of a cyber incident. In a world like that, we've got to think past these big megatrends and think more fundamentally about the drivers that ultimately move them around. In my mind, there are three core drivers. The first driver is modernization. The second driver 
is malice. And a third driver, mandates. Mandates like GDPR are out there and are continuing to loom, but they're just one example. What mandates are doing ultimately is they're forcing organizations to tie actual business value to cybersecurity. Now, look, every one of us wants to be safe and secure, but on the flip side, every single one of us has to rely on new technologies to embrace them, to move our organizations forward. We have to be willing to embrace modernization and innovation. The reality, though, is that there are many new buzzwords entering the IT lexicon. In fact, they're entering them at a staggering and perhaps even unsettling pace. Blockchain, IoT, cloud native development, something you're going to hear about when Sam comes on stage a bit later. Each of these buzzwords carries with it a certain set of risks. And it's up to us to figure out how to embrace those risks while moving forward. Consider, for example, that just a few years ago, a couple of researchers were able to disable an SUV from a remote location while it was driving. What happens a few years from now when there are millions of autonomous vehicles on the road and someone is able to disable them all at once or is able to make them accelerate all at once towards a common target? Innovation can invite exploitation. Modernization can breed malice. Human ingenuity is an incredibly powerful thing. But today's threat actors aren't satisfied. They continue to evolve. And they benefit from a vast underground economy where tools are readily available. Now, it used to be the case 10, 15 years ago that if you wanted to carry out a cyber attack, you'd have to know how to do every step end to end. Nowadays, you can focus on one step where you can add value and leverage a supply chain, a supply chain that can provide you with stolen credentials or bank account information, credit card numbers, even attack toolkits that are already made. Now, many of these inventions, so to speak, have been fueled by the rise of digital payment systems that promote anonymity, schemes like Bitcoin, for example. In recent years, we've seen a rise in ransomware attacks. Now, by the way, ransomware is not new. Ransomware has been around almost since the advent of malicious software or malware. But with the advent of digital payment schemes that enable individuals to make transactions with a certain level of privacy, not perfect privacy, but certainly more than they were getting in the past, threat actors are now able to collect on those ransoms and in turn profit more from them. And that in turn has led to a rise in popularity. In other words, a driver for threat actors is not about technology. In many ways, it's about the underlying business. In fact, threat actors today provide customer support. If, for example, your grandmother, and I don't know why people say grandmother, that could be grandfather too. Let's say your grandfather got infected with a piece of ransomware and he didn't know how to open up a Bitcoin wallet. Guess what? The threat actors have set up support pages. They'll walk you through all the steps you need. You can set up a nice Bitcoin wallet. They'll provide you with all the relevant details. You can go ahead and make your ransom payment. And you know what? More often than not, the threat actors will actually give you the cryptographic key to decrypt your data and make it all seamless. So they provide a money back guarantee, so to speak, on their efforts. Now, look, this is not you, OK? A number of years ago, I was analyzing an attack tool called Black Hole. Now, Black Hole had some really neat technical capabilities. It had exploit code for a number of well-known vulnerabilities. It was designed to be turnkey. But Black Hole also included two very specific business model innovations. The first innovation was tiered pricing. You could buy the basic version of Black Hole, which contained certain exploits, or you could pay a lot more money and get the advanced version. And the advanced version of Black Hole contained exploits for vulnerabilities people didn't even know existed. The second innovation in Black Hole, 24 by 7 customer support with a phone number you could call to reach the actual person who invented the toolkit. Okay? That means if you couldn't get the toolkit to work, guess what? You call the developer, he'd walk you through it, you're up and running and you're in business. When threat actors start talking about customer support, we are in a brand new world, a world that I call the hacker industrial complex. Now, the reason I point this out is because we often talk about the most advanced threats. We get caught up in these Ocean's Eleven type heists where people are doing these fancy zero days and whatnot. But the reality is the vast majority of threat actors, they're happy to deal with simple 7-Eleven smash and grab and make a lot of money very quickly. 
Now, in that type of world where threat actors are only trying to do what's necessary, we don't just have to worry about what the most advanced actors are doing. We've got to think about where the average attacker is. And the reality is, there's been a collective evolution. What used to be considered a sophisticated threat just five years ago is pretty much mainstream today. In fact, my pet peeve is the word advanced. People talk about advanced threats. Today, pretty much everything is an advanced threat by yesterday's standards. So now I've talked about all the gloom and doom. Let's talk about some more gloom and doom before I tell you what to do next. <laughs> We see concepts like AI and machine learning gaining a lot of traction. Now that means that people are going to have data in one place. And when data becomes in one place, it is susceptible to theft. But what scares me more is not the theft of data; it's a subtle manipulation of data. If people are going to use machine learning algorithms to derive insights from data and build models, if a threat actor can come in and make a subtle modification on data, there's a good chance nobody will notice it. Because ultimately, when you look at some of these machine learning algorithms, very few people understand the mathematics of how a deep neural network works. And so you could imagine a situation where you create a model out of data. The data has been manipulated, but you have no idea that the model is now flawed. In fact, there's a branch of research in this area called adversarial machine learning. Another example of adversarial machine learning happened quite recently in the research literature. Some researchers were able to show that by placing duct tape in the right places on road signs, they could fool autonomous vehicles. In fact, they could get an autonomous vehicle to think that a stop sign was actually a speed limit sign. Obviously, very different. And we're just at the beginning. Unfortunately, research in AI. Was not designed initially to deal with threat actors. It wasn't deal, designed to deal with adversarial scenarios. But ultimately, if we talk about any technology becoming ubiquitous, we've got to think about all the potential risks that can lie. So now I've talked about the negative stuff. Let me focus a bit more on the positive. There are some clouds, but I believe there are some silver linings as well. I want to talk about some technology advances that enable us to deal with these threat actors, and that I think will be central for us. And critical for us as we move forward. Now, the first piece of advice I want to give you is to begin by treating risk as a science, not a dark art. Channel your inner philosopher. Think things through all the way to the end. Then come back to the beginning and ask yourself, "What if?" Now you know what? That is far easier said than done. The famous Nobel Prize-winning physicist Niels Bohr supposedly said, according to the internet, he said, "Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future." Very, very wise words. Completely useless, but very wise words. But you know what? There are models. For example, the FAIR model, which stands for Factor Analysis of Information Risk, or BOTI, that enable people to actually have consistent and rigorous ways to think about risk in their environments, to quantify cyber risk in a meaningful way. Now, look, I don't believe that these models are perfect. It's very difficult to quantify something as complex as cyber risk. But I think if we can be consistent and rigorous. And actually, you know what we're referring to when we talk about cyber risk. We'll get quite a ways there. On top of that, I believe there's plenty of opportunity to apply novel techniques. For example, techniques in artificial intelligence. Now we just heard AI can be a bit of a buzzword, okay? But the reality is, you know, AI has been around for a long time, more than half a century. In fact, even the term machine learning was coined in 1959 by the artificial intelligence pioneer Arthur Samuel. And by the way. AI has been used within the context of cybersecurity for quite a long time in actual production environments successfully. We've used machine learning and AI techniques to combat spam. We've used these techniques to combat online fraud. We've used these techniques to combat malicious software or malware, and we've used these techniques to identify malicious traffic on networks. Every one of these cases, real production systems benefiting real people constantly. I'm sure every single one of us in this room, without realizing. Has benefited from one of these systems. Now I point this out because we're just at the beginning of what AI can potentially do. I can imagine a world in which we can use AI and machine learning to do predictive risk analytics, so we get a better sense of the challenges that lay ahead. And when you have a good understanding of the risks you face, when you understand what's really important, then you can take a step back and really think about what it is you need to be doing to develop your cybersecurity program. What technologies really matter? And what should your strategy look like? 
Now, unfortunately, that's also easier said than done. The reason for that is because our industry looks like this. More than 2,000 vendors, all claiming to do cybersecurity, many of whom use messaging that seems undifferentiated, and if I quite frankly, a lot of them copy messaging from each other, and most of them, probably more than 90% of them, are only focusing on very, very narrow point problems. And unfortunately, they're calling these point problems products. The reality is that we need to look much more holistically at deeper solutions. In fact, I would argue that this industry, without knowing what to do, is effectively a hot mess. So what should our path forward be? I believe we have to take a step back and think about how to simplify what we control. We can do that by consolidating and integrating our vendors. Look, the reality is that if you take a risk-based approach, you can figure out which vendors provide you with value. Double down on those vendors and ditch everyone else. Don't adopt a no-vendor-left-behind policy. <laughs> By the way, one of my customers told me that's what they do, so that's why I learned about the term. Now, in fact, I talked to one customer not that long ago who has 103 different security vendors. 103. How do you begin to manage that many vendors? How do you begin to justify the return on investment from each of these vendors while actually maintaining a proper security program? Most likely, you cannot. So therefore, think about opportunities for integration. Now, in this area, we've seen tremendous advances in technologies for security orchestration, automation, and response, or SOAR. These technologies can provide you with a common piece of connective tissue, connective tissue that can connect pieces together in your infrastructure and enable you to actually get the most out of your technologies. They can create what is effectively a force multiplier. They can enable you to automate key parts of your response playbook. And more importantly, they can also automate some of the more mundane tasks that analysts don't want to do and, quite frankly, shouldn't be doing. So I believe we can go a long way by simplifying what we control through the effective consolidation and integration of vendors and by adopting SOAR technologies. The last thing I want to talk about is planning for the chaos that you ultimately can't control. Now, here I'm reminded of Tyson's Law of Cybersecurity. Tyson's Law is named after the well-regarded cybersecurity researcher and heavyweight boxing champion Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Now, by the way, if you're in the military, the version of this is that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. However, there are some things you can do to at least make sure your plan has a fighting chance. And I call these things the ABCs of incident response planning. The A stands for availability. Your plan should only leverage available resources. Now, it sounds obvious, but it's amazing how many people get this wrong. In fact, I was talking to one of my customers recently, a new CISO. She had just joined her organization, and she looked at the incident response plan that her predecessor put together. And that plan referred to people, to process, and to technology that the company neither had nor even planned to have. It's not a surprise the previous person in that role was fired. Look, an incident response plan isn't a wish list. Don't put empty fire extinguishers in every hallway. The B stands for budget. The reality is that when an incident occurs in your environment, there will inevitably be unexpected costs. For example, if you have to interface with a legal team, you may need to hire outside law firms. You may bring in external incident response consultants. If you have to do customer communication, there could be an additional cost associated with that. Response plans must have budget authority. And in fact, I would further argue that any incident response plan without budget authority is effectively just a fairy tale. The C stands for collaboration. During the course of an incident, most functional areas of an organization can inevitably get involved. Of course, you have your IT security folks figuring out the scope of the incident, identifying the root cause, determining what needs to get fixed. You may have your IT team patching infrastructure or imaging systems or quarantining networks. Of course, you may have your legal team working if there's a legal issue. If you have to interface with customers, you may get your sales team involved. And by the way, if your sales team is talking to customers, your marketing team may be involved in determining what messages they have to deliver. If the breach is wide enough, 
if you have to notify the public more generally, then your public relations team or PR team might have to get involved. And of course, if you have to make external requisitions and purchases, then your finance team is involved. And so when you take a step back, you realize that incidents can truly become an all-hands-on-deck effort. During the course of an incident, people may be working in the office 24 by 7, possibly for days on end. That is not the time for making introductions. Think about how to look at your security incident response plan from the perspective of true collaboration, because cybersecurity is no longer just a technology issue. It has and can need to be a business issue. So I believe if you follow these three steps that I've outlined, it'll go a long way. Start off by treating risk as a science, not a dark art. Leverage frameworks like FAIR or Bowtie or others to think about risk in a rigorous and consistent way. Simplify what you control. Find opportunities to consolidate and integrate your vendors. Leverage technologies like SOAR to create playbooks that create incredible leverage from your organization. And then finally, plan for the chaos you cannot control. Use the ABCs, availability, budget, and collaboration. I believe if you conduct these three steps, you'll have an opportunity to tame chaos before it controls you. Now, all of us are here today to learn about new technologies. We're here today to figure out how our organizations can make progress. But successful progress does depend on our ability to understand the risks that lie ahead, to understand the guardrails we need to put in place. It's incumbent on us as technologists, as digital adventurers, to truly understand what we're putting into our environments so we can do so safely and sanely. But here's the thing with guardrails. Guardrails aren't here to impede progress. They're here to help you push the boundaries of progress. Much like the anti-lock brakes and seat belts in a car enable the car to go faster, I believe that understanding risks enables us to put the controls in place that allow our organizations to adapt quickly and to adopt technology in a way that fosters and fuels the pace of innovation. And more importantly, if we do so correctly, we'll not only fuel innovation, we will fuel true human progress. With that, I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to engaging with you, and have a wonderful rest of your conference.